Hey, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Ray, I'm one of the co-founders and C2 at Gauntlet. And uh, Gauntlet is building a platform uh, for testing blockchain-based protocols and applications. Uh, and I'm Bart. I'm the co-founder of Computable. We're building a tool chain for building decentralized data sets. And we teamed up with Gauntlet to kind of analyze the game theoretic dynamics of our protocol. So without further ado, um, one, maybe the place for us to start is really just introducing you folks to the idea of a decentralized data set. This is kind of a relatively new concept, so I think it might be useful for us just to kind of talk through what we mean by uh, this. So a data set is typically a large construct. Think something gigabytes, terabytes, petabytes. It cannot live on chain. So one of the core places is you need an off-chain location that stores the data set. This is something that we call the data trust. You can kind of see it down there at the bottom. Uh, for now, think of this as a trusted entity that actually can hold the data set uh, that is in question. Now, you now have like the place to store the data set, but you need a way to gather it. So we call these data set gatherers. Oh, so, uh, all right. Uh, we'll speak into the microphone and make sure that it's a little louder there. So now you have a place to store your data, but you need people to actually gather it. These are called makers. Think of them as like mechanical turkers, like folks who are out there taking pictures, taking videos, like getting the raw data into the system. Uh, and then on the other side, you have buyers, people who might want to get access to this data. Like let's say a buyer could be a self-driving car company looking for new video feeds of interesting data sets that the makers provide and that the data trust stores. And at the very top, you have these, uh, the last party called patrons. Think of these as folks who'd like to see this data set exist and who are willing to fund the makers to go out and do the legwork to gather it. So there's like four different participants kind of in this game. And we'll say more about them later, so you don't need to remember all of them, but it might help just to kind of walk through the flow of dynamics here. You can imagine that some interested party goes out and starts a new data market, which is a set of contracts that lives on chain. Then they say that, hey, I want to incentivize people to gather data for this data market. So I'm going to add some capital as a patron. So step one on the flowchart up there. Uh, then two, let's say a maker says that and says, hmm, okay, so if I can take a video that's kind of interesting for this data market, I can contribute that uh, as a chunk of data, which is called a listing, into this data market. So I kind of submit my listing into the data market. Uh, this then, the next step is then I have to uh, stream the actual data that I've gathered into the data trust, which then reports that this data has been received to the on-chain contracts, step four. Um, then step five, say a self-driving car company takes a look at this data set and says, hmm, that's interesting, I wanna buy it. They send a payment on chain, which then step six authorizes the delivery of the data, which then finally in step seven goes out to the buyer. So I probably lost half of you like somewhere in the middle of that, but you can tell why this is a complex kind of system and we want to actually partner up and do a more complex analysis. Another thing yeah, here to note is that there's actually a sophisticated set of smart contracts that implements this flow. There's like seven entirely new contracts, like we basically had to design this entire system from scratch. And one thing we really wanted to make sure of is that, you know, given all the the complexities here, you can see all the different arrows in this diagram. Does this make sense? Game theoretically, can we actually like make sure that participants in this ecosystem will behave the way we'd like them to? Um, so we built out like a number of tools to help us kind of investigate this. So we have like web, uh, web UI we can use to interact with the data market. We also have some command line tools. So we've used kind of these tools to interact with this uh, in basically a uh, hands-on experimental fashion. But still, we want to scale that out. We want to be able to actually say that, you know, what happens if hundreds of different people are interacting with the data market? Does the game theory pan out? And that's where we decided to kind of team up with our friends at Gauntlet here. So I'll pan pass the mic over to Ray. Well, yeah, so as, uh, as Bart mentioned, uh, Computable use the Gauntlet platform to help, uh, help with the design and optimization of their uh, decentralized uh, data market protocol. And uh, you know, the Gauntlet platform, we uh, do a lot of economic-based stress testing using agent-based simulation uh, to make sure that the incentives are balanced for different types of participants in the network. Uh, we want to make sure that incentives for early adopters are you know, equitable relative to later adopters in the system. 
and we just want to make sure that the whole system kind of behaves in, uh, or is expected to behave in a reasonable way, at least from like a game theoretic perspective. So yeah, kind of recap what Bart said. Um, you know, here are like the four different types of agents that we've tried to model in the system. We have buyers that uh, represent the demand for the data set. Uh, and you know, remember, buyers pay query revenue to access data from the data market. Uh, we have data trust agents that provide the com uh, compute resources for executing queries. We have makers that are the owners of the data, and they supply the data to the market in order to collect a share of the revenues from the, from the queries. And we have patrons that help to bootstrap the data market by providing initial capital and therefore incentivizing makers to contribute data in the first place. Yep. And I just realized that one other thing I forgot to mention in the overview is that there is essentially a token that's called a market token that's tied to each data market. Uh, you can kind of see this as a second contract up here. You can think of this as essentially a fractional ownership in this data set. Like let's say I as a maker have contributed 1% of a data set. I might own 1% of the outstanding market token. This is kind of a, uh, the core kind of incentive mechanism that we at Computable want to test out. Do the dynamics of this maker token make sense in this entire flow? Um, and with that, can I hand it back over to Ray who will talk a bit more about these dynamics. Yeah, so as Bart mentioned, each of uh, these markets has its own token. And the reason for this is to make sure that all the participants are incentive aligned with growing this particular market. Um, one issue uh, you know, with you know, issuing new tokens in general is that you know, when you have a new protocol or a new asset, it's very difficult to, uh, to value. And therefore, it's you know, difficult to trade uh, because you know, market makers are not going to be willing to provide liquidity for this asset because no one knows how to value it. And so, bonding curves are kind of a you know, our approach that's been taken in the space uh, to essentially have a automated market maker that is always willing to provide a buy and a sell price um, and as implemented in the form of a smart contract. And so, you know, at its simplest form. The bonding curve simply uh, consists of like a formulaic buy price and a sell price for the token as a function of the token supply. So generally, you'd expect that the price of the token would increase as the total supply of the token increases. And of course, you have to have the buy price uh, be always higher than the sell price to make sure there's not any uh, arbitrage uh, conditions. So one way of kind of thinking about the sell price is that it's a simple liquidation. Let's say I own 1% of the tokens in a data market. Then I'm entitled to 1% say of the revenues that have come in for people who've bought access to that data set. So you can see that the withdrawal price, which is kind of our technical term for the sell, uh, is basically um, my fractional share over the total supply. Uh, the support price, when we designed this, we didn't really have a key, uh, clear idea of like the functional form. So we said, you know what, let's just start with the very simple like onsets. We'll say there's like a linear function. Um, we knew this was kind of wrong, but you know, when we were coding, this is simple enough to put something in and see what happened with it. So starting from there, we kind of worked with Gauntlet too. Well, yeah, so uh, you know, back to the agent-based representation. Um, in, in our system, we have representation of the agents, and with, along with each agent, there is a set of actions that the agent is allowed to uh, use to interact with the system. Typically, these are just going to be contract calls, uh, you know, smart contract function calls. And associated with each action the agent can take, there is a utility function that the agent evaluates uh, to determine whether, you know, whether to or when to perform that action. And so here are you know, the utility functions that we use for the various agents in this particular simulation setup. And so for the, for the buyers, we actually model the buyer demand in aggregate. So we suppose that there is a single buyer agent that represents the aggregate demand for this data market. And we have a process that updates the kind of demand over time, but at high level, um, we can think of the demand as being proportional to kind of like the market share that this data market has relative to kind of a, uh, the demand cap that you see here, which is the kind of assumed upper bound on what we think this data market could be worth, right? So uh, as we mentioned, like, you know, self-driving car data, uh, you know, there's kind of some finite bound to what this data can be worth in a particular city, and so this is like, you know, the demand cap that we, we might set. Uh, so second, we have the data trust agents, 
And you know, for them, the utility function is relatively simple. Uh, they just need to ensure that their cost of executing the queries or computation uh, exceeds the amount of cost for doing the computation. So this would inclu uh, include electricity costs, server costs, things like that. Uh, for makers, the data owners, uh, their expected utility is a little bit more complex. But you know, at high level, you can break it down into a few components. So first, there is a listing reward for contributing data to the market in the first place. And we need to make sure that this listing reward uh, can offset the listing costs associated with you know, uh, getting the data formatted and submitted to the market. You can also think of the listing costs as kind of like anti-Sybil cost uh, in this model. Uh, but furthermore, makers receive a fraction of the query revenues uh, throughout the lifetime of their listing. And so we, we apply kind of like a discounted cash flow type of model to, uh, to estimate the value of this. And so you can see that the, uh, the, the maker fees are broken down into two components. One is the maker uh, fee in Ethereum, or the base token of the network. And uh, the other component is a fee in denominated in market tokens. And so we compute the expected value of all these payments uh, over, over future points in time and compute an expected utility out of that. And for the purpose of the simulations, we have patrons, but uh, we assume that they're altruistic in the sense that, that they will contribute capital initially, but they will never withdraw that capital, uh, just to keep things simple. Um, so yeah, let's talk quickly about the initial setup of the simulation, some initial conditions and parameters that we set. Uh, so for buyers, we assume that the demand cap is 100,000 Ethereum tokens per year. So again, this is like the total upper bound of the market value. And uh, so for makers, we assume that there is a supply cap of 25 makers. Uh, this is mostly just to keep the kind of performance of the simulation uh, relatively high as we're actually running the real contracts in, 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 the, in the background here. And so we can model the different agent, maker agents kind of in aggregate, um, but we can have different parameterizations of individual maker agents. And so we assume that the listed reward is three market tokens. Makers can only list once. And we assume that 80% of the makers are rational using the utility function we defined in the previous slide. And 20% are altruistic, meaning they will just list and then you know, never withdraw their tokens. And patrons. Uh, we assume that there's five initial patrons that are contributing 1,000 uh, Ethereum per patron. And so the event loop for the simulation at a high level is very simple. Um, you know, for each time step that we run, and we run the simulation for five years, we update the environment and contract state in the beginning. Uh, we have a process that initializes new agents if the demand is sufficiently high for the data. And then we simply loop through all the agents we have in the simulation and ensure that, uh, we'll evaluate their utility functions and then execute the actions that have positive utility at that point in time. Uh, so on the right hand side, you can see the results of running the simulation. And this is a heat map. Actually, each pixel in the heat map represents a single uh, simulation run. So there's a couple hundred or a hundred simulation runs represented in this heat map here. And so, what we're showing here is on the, on the x-axis, we vary the maker fee that is paid out in the market tokens from zero to roughly 40%. And on the y-axis, we vary the maker fee that's paid out in Ethereum tokens, again, from zero to 40%. And the color of the heat map represents the uh, kind of the utility share that the rational makers capture at the end of the simulation. Um, and so, you know, if, if, all, if the makers end up with all the tokens at the end, then you can expect this to be a very dark color. If the makers don't capture any of the value, then you'll see, uh, you'll see a white square. And one thing that's kind of interesting here is that the, the maker utility increases as you go up the y-axis, as you pay them more in Ethereum. But as you move along the x-axis, as you pay the makers more in market tokens, there's actually not really much of an impact on the utility that's captured. And uh, you know, this is a bit counterintuitive, as you, know, you expect this to be a pretty key parameter in the protocol. Uh, and so after running these initial results, we begin to suspect that you know, maybe something was like, not quite right with the way that we've set up the economics. Yep. So I think like, one of like, the key takeaways that we took from like, uh, seeing this chart for the first time was that the market token in its current form is kind of ill-designed, as in there is no incentive really to hold it. You'd rather get paid out and eat. 
So this kind of made us go back to the drawing board. And one thing that we talked through was that, you know, is there a mismatch in the buy-sell curves that we designed? So if you remember kind of a few slides back, I described that the buy curve was this very simple linear equation. So it turned out what was happening was essentially that the buy and sell prices were diverging. You ended up buying the market token for much more than it was actually worth in terms of the backing of actual ETH that was behind it in the sell price. So this created kind of this arbitrage, which meant that um, if you're a rational maker, you really didn't want to hold on to the market token. You couldn't sell it for that much. So what we needed to do to kind of fix this problem is we needed to find a way to tie the buy price more closely to the sell price. So what we did here was like a little bit of like math. It's, it looks a little funky when you look at it, but the intuition is pretty simple. Uh, let's say that the sell price is something like X. We want to tie the buy price to something like 1.1X, where there's like a 10% spread between the buy and the sell. This has kind of important, you know, uh, civil defense properties, it prevents people from gaming the system, but it also means that there's never a big gap between uh, what you can algorithmically buy the token at and what you can algorithmically sell the token at. This kind of creates a floor of value where it makes more sense to hold on to the market token. Now, if you look at the actual equation here that we've modified for support price, there's a little bit more going on. It turns out there's some edge conditions, so you run to this slightly more complex linear form, but the intuition really is it's that support multiplier times the withdrawal price. That is like, think of this as like 110% of uh, the sell price is the buy price, for example. So with this, we kind of went back to the gauntlet folks and we said, you know, let's uh, see what happens when we run these simulations again. Does it do better? Yeah, so we repeated the analysis that we did. Uh, the original chart is on the left. And with the, you know, the updated bonding curve uh, with the heat map on the right, and now, yeah, you can clearly see that as you increase the maker fee that's a dominant market token, you are actually, uh, the makers are actually capturing more utility. So as you move, you know, along the x-axis, the color gets darker. And also, you know, if you move along the, you know, the negative diagonal line, you see that there's actually kind of an optimal trade-off between the, the, you know, the ratio that's paid out in Ethereum tokens versus the share of the maker fee that's paid out in the market tokens. Um, so there's uh, yeah, kind of more, more interesting relationship there depending on how you want to incentivize the agents. Yeah, so this gave us a little more confidence that the actual uh, market token here was a sensible thing to have in the, con in the system rather than like a pure construct. And this is really useful because like having this market token gives us kind of a framework for a lot of the other dynamics in the protocol. So this is a really good analysis that kind of gave us more confidence that the basic design wasn't flawed. Um, there's also more analysis that. Yeah, so all the previous slides that we were talking about are analyzing things from the perspective of the makers. Uh, you know, and going back to our original goal for the simulation, we wanted to make sure that the rewards were balanced between the different types of participants. So here we do a similar analysis, but now we're looking at the utility share, uh, and this is a percentage that is captured by the initial patrons uh, as you vary the new bonding curve parameters. And so, yeah, again, in this heat map, each individual pixel is one simulation run. And here we are varying the conversion rate and support multiplier parameters uh, that, you know, Bart just explained in the updated bonding curve. And so there's like a few regions of the chart here that are interesting. Um, and so one is that a, a high support multiplier actually benefits initial patrons uh, because that limits the uh, inflation with the market token over time. And so that is uh, kind of the you know, top part of the graph. When the conversion rate is high, the initial patrons fail to break even on their initial deposit. And uh, you know, finally, if you in the lower left corner, you'll see there's kind of like a white bar there. Uh, when the conversion rate and support, support multiplier are too low, uh, there's just not in enough incentive for the makers to contribute data in the first place. So in some sense, the entire network fails. And so from doing this type of analysis, you can you know, see the kind of trade-offs between different parameterizations, and sometimes you might discover these really interesting kind of phase transitions that happen uh, in your network as you kind of go between you know, areas where there's positive feedback loops versus like negative feedback loops. And yeah, so you know, uh, just to recap, the you know, goal of doing this analysis was to you know, make, sh uh, make sure that we can construct a data market that uh, will likely 
maximize buyer demand over the long term uh, while making, ensuring that the incentives are equally distributed between uh, the different types of agents in the system. And uh, the key finding that uh, we found initially was that the shape of the bonding curve was not, uh, not optimal in the sense that uh, you know, the market tokens were not really incentivizing makers uh, for kind of longer term participation. And I think from, uh, from our perspective, this kind of provided a powerful check on some of our intuitions when we were designing the market. So like for any of you folks who've worked on protocol design, you do a lot of whiteboarding, you do a lot of like talking through like, you know, if I were a person doing X, what would happen? And this is a powerful way of like thinking about a protocol, but there's limits because like there's a lot of moving parts in many of these systems. So being able to actually work with simulated agents, being able to scale it out, and actually being able to like f uh, find some weak points and improve the dynamics really kind of helped us refine our design and tighten the loop. Um, and this, the most kind of visible example of this is the fact you know we fixed our bonding curve dynamics based off feedback from the simulation. Um, but you know in many other smaller ways, it's actually proven a powerful loop. Um, so we've continued working with the Gauntlet team past like. Uh, the results reported here. And as we've deployed more of these data markets on test nets, and I think next month onto a main net, uh, we found that being able to take our intuition, run them against a the simulation, uh, and then check that our basic intuition matches the computational experiment provides us like a very powerful bit of confidence that you know the dynamics that we've thought about are actually tuned to something that makes sense. So I think like if you're designing a new protocol, I'd definitely recommend uh, considering the use of these simulation-based techniques to check your economic intuitions, because as we found out, there are times when your base intuition cannot really game out all the dynamics that might happen in a complex system. Um, so with that, thank you so much for listening. Thank you.